Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The following is a presentation of the American Meteorological Society. Founded in 1919, the 13,000-plus members of the American Meteorological Society strive to advance and communicate knowledge concerning the atmosphere and related sciences, technologies, applications, and services for the benefit of society. At each AMS annual meeting, time is devoted not only to presenting the latest in scientific discoveries, but also how scientists can translate this knowledge in terms understandable to other scientists, lay audiences, and the public at large. Good morning, I'm Mike Beam and I'm the director of uh, preparedness in FEMA Region 2 out of New York City. Uh, I'm also now transitioning over to become the director of disaster assistance for, that, for the region. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Region 2 is New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So hurricanes are our life in Region 2 because we have coverage of Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. What should we prepare for? Obviously, natural disasters are the one thing, and I usually ask audiences, and I probably have mostly professionals in here in meteorology, I, I, I'm going to ask the questions, however, that I normally ask. Um, how many people in here believe that uh, they or members of their extended family will be impacted by a natural disaster in the coming year? Just by a show of hands. All right. How many will believe that they, they or member, members of extended family will be impacted within the next five years? See, the numbers go up. Ten years. Okay. How many people believe that we're going to be impacted by terrorism in the next year? How many believe that we'll be impacted, and I'm not talking about you now, I'm talking about us as a nation. How many believe that we'll be impacted in the next five years? How many in the next 10 years? See, this, this is amazing. We, every time we ask this question, everybody understands that we're going to be struck by natural disasters, yet a lot of, of what we're trying to, to understand, and, and we're trying to, of course, now as we get preparedness back in, begin to focus back on that which impacts us most in natural disaster. Not to say that terrorism and suburning are not important, it is however the thing that most people realize will impact all of us at some point in time in our lives, in, in all likelihood, is natural disasters. And so obviously with pendulum swings back and forth here, and terrorism has been a challenge, it will continue to be a challenge, but we should not neglect natural disasters. Technological, and I won't get into that, that's most of the time where somebody's going to attack our, our, our internet capability, our banking, whatever else. Uh, and there are obviously plans for how we deal with that. And the new disaster du jour is pandemic. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to start focused on, on pandemic. Uh, and there are huge challenges under pandemic that, that all of us need to, to understand and prepare for. Uh, that under the, what we believe would happen is if pandemic began and began to spread, in communities you could lose as much as 40 to 45 percent of your workforce. And we have to start looking at how we would operate in that environment and continue to be able to provide critical services and keep power companies and all that operational. Next slide. Uh, how should we prepare? And, and this is the one most amazing to me is the campaign awareness that starts at home, three days worth of supplies and a family emergency plan. By our studies, normally about 15, 17 to 35 percent of the population actually takes to heart the concept or idea of being prepared at, at their level. In other words, at the public level. Most of them don't set in the three days worth of supply, and very few of them do the emergency family plan. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of why it's critical. Here in New Orleans, uh, after the event occurred, there was in one particular case I used an example. One of the helicopters came in to retrieve uh, individuals and take them to other centers. As one helicopter came in, it had very limited space on board. There was a family that had five small children, under, all under the age of seven, and two adults. All they could do was fit the children on board the, on the, board the helicopter. So they took that fa the children to a site and dropped them off. When they dropped them off, it wasn't just handing them to somebody and say, take these children over. They were set down, 
people did collect them after, after a period of time, I, hopefully I, I don't know the details of whether it was minutes, hours, or whatever, and took them to a center. Unfortunately, the children had never been taught, if we get separated, call grandma in California, call Aunt Millie in, in Oklahoma, call Uncle Jeff in, in Indiana. And this is what we're trying to get people to understand now. Start into this campaign of family emergency planning and, and, and awareness. Because the more that you do that, the more they're going to be prepared. Because in the environment that we're in, many of us, and I look across this audience and I see a few of you that are graying like I am, we, we learned, came in, a, in an era in which we could walk out to an airplane, you didn't get searched, you didn't get questioned what, and you got onto an airplane. But forever and now, our, our lives will change. Our children will never know that sort of environment, that they aren't constantly under the threat of something or concern about it. So the more that they get themselves prepared, all of us get prepared, the better off we're going to be. Because terrorism could occur anywhere at any time and tear us apart rather quickly, as can natural disasters, all right? Earthquakes and those sorts of things can happen real quickly. And so we need to do more to teach people to be more aware on what they should do as individuals and as family. We also encourage strong plans and exercises. And I can tell you, as we went through, obviously we found weaknesses in those during Hurricane Katrina that began at the local level. And I will not tell you that we were with blameless. The federal level, there were weakness in the plans and the exercising capability that we obviously had weaknesses there that were very apparent as we went through Katrina. Have a strategy for response. And I'll talk about ICS, the Incident Command System, in a moment. But I always tell individuals and groups now, have your strategy also. How are you going to deal with this? It's one thing to have plans. It's another to have a strategy. And I'll talk more about strategy in a moment. Insurance, insurance, insurance. I think all of us now know that uh, as a result of the hurricane activities over the fat last few years, insurance is becoming more of a challenge. Uh, that insurance companies in many cases are dropping individuals from policies and or not writing new policies. And so it becomes more of a challenge. More states are going, as the state of Florida has, to a state-run insurance program as an alternative. If an individual can't find an insurance program, the state does have an insurance program. And more states are looking at that. Uh, I come from and live in New Jersey, but deal with Long Island. And Long Island now has begun to have to realize because insurance companies are starting to drop them uh, from, from insurance policies. And have a robust coup and cog plan. And I think you would saw some of the failures of continuity operations and continuity government during Katrina. Uh, and the stronger that those plans and programs are, the more that you are going to be able to have resiliency and rebound after an event. And obviously know the risks and vulnerabilities. And I suspect that uh, as professionals that, that, that you are dealing with it, you understand most of the risks and vulnerabilities. But I'm not sure that at the local level, most of the citizens and the leadership all understand the risks and vulnerabilities. Next slide. In readiness for 2008, we've already begun doing what we're calling the gap analysis. The gap analysis where we're going into communities and we ask them a series of questions. We're looking at some specific things like uh, evacuations, uh, sheltering, commodities, and the distribution plans and programs. And obviously we want to understand this because we as the federal government are going to be expected to respond rather quickly to shore up that capability at the local level. So before we can do that, we need to understand what those challenges are. Because nowadays, most people at, at the general public level have a high expectation the federal government is an immediate responder, that it will be there within the first hours. And people need to begin to realize the federal government's ability to stand up its operations and move and deploy people takes about 72 to 96 hours. But we are doing a lot to lean a lot fo more forward and start to really re preposition commodities and materials, which we did, for example, during Dean. A uh, greater number of prescripted mission assignments, that's where under the gap analysis we're understanding what the challenges are and we do what we're calling prescripted mission assignments. In other words, we're deciding who in the federal government can perform and fill that gap. So we're doing assignments against that where we can quickly say, here's your job, there's $20 million or a billion dollars, go do that mission. Increased training on federal response actions and procedures, you're going to see a lot more in this regard. As the, as the year goes by, each region is gaining about three to four people to focus on training and exercises. And the, I already talked about the growth in FEMA staffing, so I won't repeat that. Next slide. Managing expectations. Next slide. This is World Trade Center. For those of you that uh, saw it from the, from the ground, and, and I'll go into some of the challenges. I, we don't have a laser pointer here, do we? Okay. 
Um, obviously, it's fairly easy to figure out where World Trade Center used to sit. Uh, but I will tell you that there were huge challenges that we now have to address from a standpoint of dealing with natural disasters and man-made disasters such as this, and that is re-entry to the area. Uh, and it's ten from the standpoint of private sector, it's a real challenge. Obviously, around World Trade Center, there were significant amount of private sector activities. Uh, there was no procedure or process to allow individuals to re-enter that area. Emergency responders could get in there, but the private sector could not. I personally had to escort a guy from Verizon around for a full day to reestablish towers all down in this area so we could try and reestablish telephone connections, cellular telephone. Just to put this in perspective, the challenges under an event like this, World Trade Center, uh, and, and I can answer questions after, I won't, I won't go into a lot of questions now, but World Trade Center, when it came down, obviously caused some huge problems beyond what those of what you may have been aware of. Uh, and that was that all the southern towers for most of the New York metropolitan area, northern New Jersey, and up to Connecticut were on the top of these towers, as were the broadcast capabilities for uh, ABC, or I think CBS, NBC, PBS, and a large number of radio stations. And when the towers came down, obviously they were knocked off the air, which is a real challenge when you're starting to deal with a general public that doesn't all have cable or satellite. And so they're in the dark. They don't know what's going on, and that's what you don't want to have with the general public, is not having an ability to inform them. So th when that came down, there were huge challenges, and to reestablish telephone communications. In addition, Tower 7, which uh, is also in that debris pile, was where the Emergency Operations Center for New York City was. When it collapsed, it also collapsed on top of the Verizon switch, which was underneath the building and knocked out all the telephone service for most of Manhattan and the 911 system for Manhattan. So again, I could go on for hours telling you the huge challenges, but the big things to understand is the ability to reestablish and reconnect what you know needs to be done infrastructure-wise. Next slide. I don't need to tell you what that is. I think most of you could tell me a lot more about the dynamics of that event, but I will tell you, which had a pointer, put you in, in, in context, you can see the lake over there. I was up in the upper right quadrant of the eye of the hurricane as it came into Mississippi. Uh, and obviously, I don't need to tell you the dynamics of this activity. I will tell you, however, uh, I was out like an, a moron, and I will tell you that uh, I've learned my lessons. When somebody says go inside during these events, go inside. Uh, the mayor and I, Mayor Gulfport and I, went looking for Jim Cantori at 10.30 in the evening. As the hurricane was coming in and we're watching debris flying all around, we're all looking for Cantori. All right, so uh, obviously we didn't find him because he had gone, decided to go to a little higher elevation in the, in the facility he was at. Until the next day when, if you've seen the pictures, he decided to wade, go back down and was standing in the water when it was rising and later lost his vehicle. Um, but I would tell you that I had turned to the mayor as we finished our discussion. I said, Mayor, take one last look at this beach area. Tomorrow it'll be gone. And he looked at me and says, you're kidding. And I said, no, all of this will be destroyed. And I said, because this is not a, it, just a small event, you need to understand what you're dealing with here. Now, he had no idea. And he relates that story nowadays saying, the FEMA guy told me the night before what to expect, and I had no idea. And I didn't realize when I was down there that many of the people in that area still had not left their homes. I thought they had all evacuated. I thought they had all heeded the warning. But a lot of people down there said, hey, we live through Camille. You know, we'll be able to survive this. Next slide. And I'll get into more of those. This is the, this is the, wind, the, the, the final wind analysis as it would apply over the East Coast area. If we stuck it, and I'll walk off the stage here for one second to put it in context. Um, this, just so you understand, this is the District of Columbia. Uh, so this is putting it over the, the, the eastern part of the country. Uh, and you can see where automatically the challenges would be huge when you apply the wind fields to this event. So if we put this in the, popu the populated areas of the Northeast, you've got some huge challenges. So obviously... You can point, sir, with the mouse. Yeah. Oh, I can. And By just laying the mouse? No, well, you know, move it around to the points where you want it. To. Oh, oh, perfect. I didn't realize that. And you still want to advance the slide. I was going to say, again, this, if we put this over northeast, and most of you have heard of the, of, of the 
the Northeast, what they call the Northeast Express, which came in 1938 across Long Island and came up and did horrendous damage in Delaware. But if we put this anywhere on the East Coast, you have some huge challenges. Uh, we've already done the studies in New York City, the slosh models and all that. And you've got to understand, you start looking at the dynamics of a, a, a hurricane going into there, is that 65% of the population is transportation dependent. Uh, and we've started asking, okay, if you start this concept, exactly what happens? And, and they really have not really started to wrestle with it until this past year. And now they have some real challenges. Next slide. Um, who has expectations? Uh, and I'll, I'll give you this back because I'm not sure that I'll need it again, but if I do, I know how to get this now. General public, elected officials, news media, state emergency management, federal government, and local emergency management all have expectations. And it's amazing the differences in that expectation and what drives those expectations. News media drive elected officials, elected officials, general public, general public, and the other reverse. I mean, it's amazing when you start looking at the dynamics of the expectations. But everybody has high expectations of what's going to happen and when. Next slide. These are some of the things I wrestled with uh, during the, the, the 85 days I was there. Uh, and I have to tell you, I hope I never have to go through some of the challenges I had in Harrison County. Um, immediately afterwards, within the first 24 hours, there was an expectation of commodity availability. People started lining up six miles in length in some cases to get commodities, water, fuel, and ice, and that sort of thing. When can I get back into my home? When will power be restored? How can I get medication? That was a huge new issue because nowadays much of the senior population gets it by mail. Mail was suspended. They couldn't get their uh, uh, medications. And people actually resorted to calling the only operational radio station. And I remember one particular lady, and this is when I panicked and raced to the radio station, called up and said, my son takes five milligrams of such and such and said he's out. Somebody else called in and said, well, I got 10 milligrams. I'll drop it out of the station, cut them in half, and give them to them. We're not encouraging self-medication. And have people running their own pharmaceutical process. And so we tell people, they did that. and so we now are working with CVS, Walgreens, and all that, because it turns out that most pharmacies cannot open or operate without a licensed pharmacist in the facility. So we're trying to, to work with them to try and figure out how they can share capabilities. Uh, how and where can I get medical care? How soon can I get temporary housing? How do I get funds to live on? And I will tell you, a lot of people figured that out, that we had one guy here in New Orleans that got 12 of those little credit cards at $4,000 a crack. Uh, and now he he's actually had the problem with temporary housing. He now has that resolved. He now has all of his meals and his temporary housing taken care of for a number of years, OK, because we did prosecute. But he had registered himself 12 times for, that, for those funds. Uh, what are the state and federal government doing? Next slide. Uh, local challenge, Hurricane Katrina. I'll go through these rather quickly. Uh, next slide. This is Gulfport, Mississippi. For those of you not familiar with it, and I will need this so I can get this in the next slide or two. Let's see if I can find my arrow. Okay. For those of you not familiar, this is, this is US 90. That was the bridge, and I'll show you a different slide in a second. But the primary industry in Mississippi is gambling. Uh, and these are, these are the hotels. Uh, the casinos were on the water out here. That's one casino, and that's another casino. These are about two blocks long and six stories tall, and that gives you some idea of, the, of that surge that came in there. And we, read, we found it somewhere between 22 and 32 feet in some cases. And the challenge was that it entered these back bays at the same elevation. Uh, and I'll show you pictures 10 miles inland of what the impact was. But this is, this is East Biloxi. Uh, all of it wiped out. I met a family from right in here that had decided to stay and they climbed into a boat that was chained to a tree and as the water arose, so did the boat fortunately. As it set back down, they survived. But there were a lot of individuals in this area who lived through Camille and said, how do we live through this? And they climbed up in their attic. And unfortunately, they entombed themselves because the water rose higher than the attic. Plus, they had no procedure to get out of the attic. Um, and I will tell, relate one story and tell you this is one that People need to take heart. There was a young lady that I met that was on the other, this is 26 miles coastline in this county. I met her. She was further up where the storm came in. She climbed up in the attic, and she was eight, month, eight months pregnant. Uh, she took her cell phone with her, and when she got up in there in the water, she saw it through the, the, the hole in the ceiling, whatever, uh, that after the storm passed, she couldn't figure out how to get out. Uh, but she was very smart. She tried to dial on her cell phone, and of course she didn't connect. Uh, and she kept, she dialed and then she immediately shut it off as soon as she knew she wasn't connecting. She was in that attic for 10 days. 
So she finally connected with a family member in Indiana who contacted us and we were able to get emergency responders down there and get her out. But she was smart not, not to leave that cell phone on. And it's one of the things that I take as a lesson to tell people, listen, if you're going to get trapped, don't constantly use the cell phone because once you've run out of power, there is no other option. All right. But this was a huge challenge and I'll go through more of those in a second. Next slide. This is the, just another view of that. These are multi-ton concrete units. Obviously, 32 feet would just toss these around kind of like tinker toys. Next slide. Uh, this is just the back bay. Again, it entered in here and went back in. And a lot of the residents in this area and on the other side had not bought flood insurance because they were not in a zone for flood insurance. And the insurance companies, of course, said, you're not covered, so we're not paying because this was a flooding incident, whether it was driven by winds or whatever. Next slide. This is <clears throat> the Hard Rock Cafe. That was one of those casinos you saw a moment ago. This had not been turned over the contract. It was supposed to open the week after. Uh, and so this was completely destroyed. The water in here had come up to this level in the parking garage. Next slide. This is 10 miles inland on Interstate 10 and the debris fields that were pushed out of the woods onto it, which made it even more challenging for us to be able to respond and get materials in there because we had to clear the roadways. And a lot of these high power tension line, power lines were laying across the roadway in a lot of cases. So we had to take care of those issues first. Next slide. Uh, just to give you some idea, this is one of the businesses right on the beach that just gives you some idea of the, what will happen as the surge of the water comes through and just rips it apart. Next slide. Again, this is probably about 15 feet above sea level. There's a mall right over here that was heavily damaged but just rips the, the bejeebies out of business. Next slide. I just put these in. Our, my debris field, and this was a huge challenge for us, was 26 miles long. There's a railroad track right back there. Most of the debris and, and a lot of this area was pushed up against that railroad track, and I had a 26-mile long, 40-foot wide, 20-foot tall debris field. Um, and we have some real issues there. I don't want to spend time going into it, but when you look at our process, we're not supposed to pay for that if it's private or public. And I, fi you know, I finally said, get the lawyers down here, and if they can tell whose is which, I'll tell them to get out of the pile. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just another one of these casinos. That was the Holiday Inn. Uh, and you can see that they did a pretty good job of smashing that. This facility was their convention center. It had water up to this level. Uh, and ultimately, they had, there was a determination to rebuild. Originally, they were talking about destroying the facility. Next slide. These were inland, about six or eight blocks. You just found a lot of these boats. Uh, and we had to tell people, you got, don't do anything with them. They all have to be removed. And it was a place we called the Field of Dreams. It was 1,300 acres of nothing but boats and cars that had been destroyed. These can't, and nothing can be done with these until the insurance companies decide on the settlement. Next slide. This is the hotel I actually was booked into. Um, it was just a half block, about 16, 18 feet above sea level. But uh, had I decided, because the, the mayor said, listen, we can go down and open the hotel. You can stay in there if you want. And I said, nah, I don't think so. Uh, if you had, they probably would have seen pictures of me strapped to this concrete thing by bungee cords or something. Next slide. Just an aerial view of that same hotel. But you can see the debris fields. These were all residential properties. Next slide. This is the VA facility. I'll show you a different picture of this, but this is a, it was totally destroyed uh, and no longer is going to be used by the federal government. It's going on off of the system anyway. Next slide. That's that building, solid concrete rebar. Again, just gives you some idea of the dynamics. Next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip through these because I think my time's almost up. Next slide. This was one of my best, first challenges. This is US 90. And in this direction is to the west. And uh, the one of few points that we could get to the west was down this roadway. However, this casino was blocking it. And they came to me and said, what do you want done? And I said, hmm, my choice? And they go, yes. And I said, blow it up. So we blew it up. Uh, we blew up the upper portion. And then we dragged this barge with bulldozers back out into the water. Uh, this was back over here about a quarter, about a half mile. Uh, next slide. This was one of my huge challenges. This is what remains of the port facility. The port was over here, about three quarters of a mile. This is paper products. But in amongst that is over five million pounds of shrimp, five million pounds of chickens, and five million pounds of pork bellies. Uh, and you talk about a huge challenge with this, one, the smell, and two, the health issues. But I had a resolution, because somebody came about the third day and told me we have a new problem. And I go, oh, please, do tell. And they said, alligators. And I said, alligators? And they said, yes. They're in there eating the chickens and shrimp. And I said, why is that a problem? I said, they're resolving the removal. 
I said, well, worry about them later, but let, right now, don't, don't let them do what they will. Uh, there's no reason to remove the alligators. Uh, but obviously, we did have some significant challenges of these sorts of debris piles. Next slide. This, so that you ever go through one in your community, this, I had lots of military working for me, and they were out bulldozing the streets, and, and, and I told them, do not bulldoze anything in the street till you've taken pictures from all sides. This specific case, this individual had come back afterwards when his insurance company came and says, where's your house that you're applying the claim on? He said, I have no idea. And so they came and asked, he came and asked us, and we gave him these pictures, and he was able to settle with his insurance company. So I tell him, do not bulldoze until you've taken pictures of all sides, because something like that could come up. Next slide. Uh, this, uh, just general debris pictures to give you some idea. Uh, I think most of you have seen these sorts of things from here in New Orleans. Next slide. Uh, again, this is part of that debris pile. There's the railroad tracks. This is getting closer to where the storm actually entered. Next slide. Next slide. For those that haven't seen this before, I put this slide in because you'll see it at any point in the future, and you see these numbers out of a building. This tells you this building has been searched by an urban search and rescue team. It was searched on September 4th and again on September 9th. This would tell you the organization, and I do not know the acronym SF. This is a, this is a Utah team. Uh, this, this says that there were no injured and no dead, all right? So this has been completely searched. Next slide. This, I always put in as an interesting slide, is the challenges of, of uh, private sector. This Walmart was about uh, 18 feet above sea level in Long Beach, uh, Mississippi. If you look, most of you probably bet in a Walmart, you'll notice nothing inside this building. No shelves, no nothing. And then they go, where did it go? Next slide. There's where it went. That is the insides of Walmart, all right? Uh, and so this is easy for us to determine, Walmart, you've got to remove this. But when it mixes in to these neighborhoods, it becomes a different challenge. Next slide. This just gives you, I, this is moving closer to where the eye came in. This is an apartment complex, the Walmart, you'll see in a moment on a different slide. Next slide. Oh, sorry, I didn't put it in there. But the Walmart, uh, the Walmart was back over to the side. But this just, again, gives you some idea of that impact of the surge in there. Lessons learned, incident command system worked. Those of you who have heard about incident command system, it really does work. The community down there, Harrison County, has now adopted officially. I added an executive group in because elected officials are not part of the command structure. They met twice a day, and by the decision to do that, they self-police themselves. I said, I will ask you to come to me every day and tell me what your issues are. Do not take them public to the media. Do not take them to upper elected officials above your level till you've given me the opportunity to address them. And they were quite satisfied. Uh, they never took anything out outside of that process. Uh, ensured all levels work together at an incident command management team. That's where you get a team that comes in from other state to help you collect a strategy more effective and focused. And I'm probably out of time. Uh, so I'm going to probably let's skip through this to see if there's any, any additional ones we need to go ahead. Next slide. Um, I won't go into these. I have another speaking engagement at 4.30 tomorrow, so I'll get some of this out of there. Next slide. That's it? Okay. Yeah, it's all, all of the rest of it. I, in that, do you want me to ask, let them ask questions or? Uh, actually, no. Okay. You don't get to ask any questions. <laughs> Perfect FEMA system. <laughs>